So my talk is the introduction to the Nihon University Japanese Longitudinal Study of Aging, and I've, I've been collecting data since 1999, so it's 16 years. So it's been, it's already 16 years, and I'm really surprised to realize that I've been doing the same thing for over the last 16 years. Anyway, the, uh, perp the reason why I started this uh, uh, survey is actually exactly what uh, Professor Ishida said. When I came back to Japan in 1994 from the US, I couldn't find the data I can use, especially longitudinal data. So um, I wanted to collect the longitudinal data and to share with uh, other researchers in, in Japan and as well as in the, in the other countries. So the, uh, that was actually the motivation I had to conduct this survey. And the purpose, uh, the purpose of the survey is that investigate levels of and changes in health, health status of Japanese elderly. And actually I was interested in computing health expectancy using longitudinal data. Well, I will explain what the health expectancy is in my later half of my presentation. And in investigate factors affecting health status and changes in health status over time. To do that, you have to have a longitudinal data. If you have a cross-sectional data, it's basically correlation, uh, uh, relationship that all basically you can study. Without longitudinal study, you cannot really establish the causation and collect comparable data to other longitudinal data for cross-national comparisons and help advancing research on Japanese energy by re uh, releasing the data. And actually, the, uh, uh, Professor Ishida mentioned four surveys, longitudinal surveys on aging. Actually, he's missing one. Um, this is a Professor uh, Sugihara. Uh, at the time, uh, he was at the uh, uh, Tokyo Metropolitan Institute of Gerontology. He started another launch study in 1999. It's not well known, but he has this uh, three waves. I think he conducted three waves of data. Actually, that modeled uh, the HRS. So first HRS is actually conducted by Professor Sugihara, and I think he is trying to do uh, uh, another round of the survey in, in the coming years. Anyway, so this is the purpose. I, I studied this longitudinal study, and this is uh, what I did. Uh, I started in November 1999. It's a face-to-face -face interview, and followed up in 2001, 2003, two years apart. Uh, all of them were uh, face-to-face -face interview. And 2006, um, it's very difficult to get funding for individual researchers to conduct uh, the longitudinal study, it's going to cost a lot. And actually, it costed about half a million for each wave. So um, first wave, I did it in three years, in two, uh, 2006, and then 2009. It's all up to fifth wave. It's a face-to-face -face interview. And sixth wave, uh, I couldn't manage to get the enough funding to do the face-to-face. Uh, uh, interviews, so I did mail survey because I need to keep them in the in the in the survey. Otherwise, they will drop dead. And uh, also, it's difficult to find the pre people uh, to find out whether they are still alive or not. They're very old already, so I just need to keep them up. And also, actually, we are sending the uh, um, New Year card and the uh, uh, summer card. It's two, uh, two cars a year. So just keeping in the, in the survey and find out whether they are still alive. Because if the person die, the card may return, or the family member of the uh, respondent will respond that telling us the person has already died. So it's, I, I've been doing for 16 years, the sending two postcards a year. <laughs> And well, I'm very uh, grateful for the university to allow me to do that for 16 years. It, just sending card cost us a lot, anyway. So survey design is uh, for first wave. It's a nationally representative sample of 65 and over. It's a baseline at the 65 and over. And um, we had uh, 67,600 uh, 67 persons uh, 
selected by the multi-state multi stratified random sampling. And oversampled over of those age 75 and over by a factor of two. So we can, we can analyze uh, detailed analysis for the uh, very old age. And th these are the face-to-face -face interview survey using a structured survey uh, questionnaire. And we allow the uh, uh, proxy. For later waves, uh, sample refreshing, we did only a second and third. Um, because it's a longitudinal, we lose the youngest group, age group. So 65 and 66, we kept up two ages in second wave and third wave. But fourth wave in 2006 and fifth wave, I didn't do it, partly because it's costly. And also after 2005, the uh, privacy protection law was enforced and the, the, uh, the response rate would have dropped a lot. So I gave up to uh, rep uh, ref uh, refresh the sample for uh, fourth and fifth wave. First wave I had, in 1999, I had 49.97. Uh, it's about 75 response rate. And wave two, so wave two we followed up, 49.97, and we added 900 for age 65 and 66. And the uh, total number was the uh, 46.23. And uh, among those 49.97, 327 dead deceased. So 2007, we had 4507 and 381 passed away. And 2006, 2009, and 2013, this responded uh, person are very small. Basically, it's because of the male survey. The response rate wasn't that great. Anyway, this is the basic information on the survey I'm, I'm conducting. And uh, here, the first wave, uh, it took about 70 minutes. So it, it's really long. It took a long time. And probably the, the longest, it took like a three hours. So it's very hard for elderly people to uh, interview in that such a long, long hours. So some of the interview has to be done in two days. And, but we try to keep it, um, minimize the, the interview time, but because we are asking uh, lots of questions, so the, uh, it took 70 minutes. And I was told that, that by the survey company who conducted the interview, our, uh, our uh, survey instrument, the questionnaire was the longest in the, in the history of the uh, survey company. Well, I had the uh, numbers here. Um, baseline sample characteristics, uh, what I had. Uh, male and female, and uh, proxy, and uh, uh, self-respondent. So self-respondent had about 4,300 4, cases, and proxy was about 600 cases. Then male and female, it's about the same, but slightly more for females, like 52% females and 48% for males. And the next slide, I, I had the uh, numbers by the uh, a five year age group. And so the uh, uh, age 65 to 69, I had about 1,500 cases, uh, slightly less than that. And, uh, 70 to 74, I had 900. And then 75 to 79, I had, we had uh, more than 1,000 because we did oversample, factor of two. The uh, uh, numbers for the age 60, uh, 70 to 74 uh, had less. So 75 to 79 had more uh, cases. And question items in the wave one, I'm just introducing what kind of questions are available. And the, uh, basically the demographic attribute, family structure, socioeconomic status, intergenerational exchange, information on sur uh, surviving children's family, health behavior, chronic condition. Those the standard uh, health uh, surveys and social surveys. And uh, 
physical functioning uh, for elderly, it's the functioning is getting very uh, important. So uh, I asked ADL, IADL, and energy measures. And basic, basically, I, I modeled uh, the longitudinal study of aging in the US and it, uh, the AHEAD. So it's a uh, initial version of the uh, HLS. HLS was combined in 1998 uh, with the uh, AHEAD. So AHEAD is a data part, the 70 and above. Uh, the respondent for AHEAD was 70 and above, and HLS was 50 to 69. But those two surveys, longitudinal survey, was combined in 1998. And I was uh, kind of, I modeled um, AHEAD and LSOA conducted in 19, 1984 to two, uh, 1990 and 1990 to 2000, anyway. So those questions are comparable with the US um, LSOA or AHEAD. So that's why I, I wanted to do comparative study with uh, US data. And also the uh, Singaporean data, the, the, the next person, Professor uh, Chan will present, that is some part that's comparable with our data and HLS. Uh, did I miss anything? Oh, and here it's, it's dental health, like a number of teeth, uh, chewing ability. Uh, those are getting very important nowadays. And uh, I included that question in 1999 because I was wondering uh, how much this, those number of teeth or the chewing ability affect health status of the uh, elderly people. And actually it showed. And we had a paper in 2006 the chewing ability affect the health status, but not the number of years to their life expectancy. There is no significant difference between by the uh, chewing ability, but health status was kind of affected by chewing ability. Anyway, so next slide. In the wave two, uh, so starting wave two, we can follow those who deceased when they die, how they die. So in HLS, I think it's called exit survey. So the person who, who died, we asked uh, close to the, to, to the person, we asked the question. And um, 2000, uh, the, starting wave two in Japan, that the uh, long-term care insurance system started in 2000. So in 2001, uh, I included the question on this um, question on the long-term care. And th this is another reason I started the survey in 1999. I wanted to see the change in the attitude toward the, the long-term care insurance. So 1999, it's before the system started. And 2001, it's already started and years passed. And wave three, we added sleeping disorder, pain and stress, and uh, restless leg syndrome. These questions I added. And wave four, um, we, then we added anthropometric measures in wave four. I think our survey is one of the first to incorporate those uh, measures, the physical measurement. And for wave four in 2006, we had a blood pressure. So we had more than 300 blood pressure I had to buy. And uh, so each is at the interior, carry those blood pressure and uh, grip strength machine. So drip, grip strength diameter, and they measured grip strength, hand grip strength and blood pressure. And also we did waist and uh, leg length and knee height and we didn't, actually, we didn't the, uh, measure height and weight for the wave four, but we did it in the wave five. And started in wave four, we added cognitive functioning because, well, I'm kind of uh, hesitant to include these, but uh, I couldn't avoid including those because it's very important issue. And anchoring, anchoring vignettes, 
this is uh, uh, used in the uh, uh, World Health Survey by WHO. And uh, so I was uh, interested in testing the, uh, this uh, anchoring vignette as a method of survey. And uh, turns out it's not that great, but it's based on a Singaporean study, there's uh, some differences. Uh, the, using this anchoring vignette, uh, you may need to adjust the differences in the reporting of health status by ethnic group, I think. Well, this is just uh, showing the uh, grip strengths, what we measured, the men and women, this much of a difference, and it decreased as you expect. And this is used by the, uh, in the uh, uh, study, comparative study, US, Japan, and Denmark. And the, if you look at the uh, strengths, and here it's uh, Denmark, Danish, and this is the US, and this is Japan. Well, the grip strings is supposed to be a good measure of the mortality. And then here, Denmark is the highest, they're the strongest. They're big and strong. And US too. And Japan, the Japanese elder is the weakest. However, Japanese are the longest lived among those three countries. And uh, wave five, uh, as I mentioned, we added height and weight. And wave six, this is just a uh, male survey. So the number of questions asked is very limited. But we added the uh, disaster-related health question. Because, because of the 2011 earthquake in Japan, I was wondering how those, the uh, earthquake affected not only the region, but entire Japan, how it was affected. So uh, I haven't really uh, uh, analyzed in detail for this that uh, the paper will come using these uh, measures. Uh, we have six sample characteristics. This is by age group. And now studies conducted uh, using NUJRSOA. Sorry for this uh, in Japanese, but because I found that Professor Ishida is presenting <laughs> just in front of me, and he's the one who used my data. Uh, so that's why I just wanted to show, well, you can't really see, but inequality in changing society, and uh, he's studying inequality in health using first and second wave. Those are the waves, the data set I released. And I'm moving to the, uh, the, uh, the kind of work I'm doing now. And based on those surveys, I'm computing life expectancy. Do you know life, what the life expectancy is? Probably you, you, you heard the word life expectancy. How many years you can live, basically, on average? Okay, this is the, uh, the, the population measure, not the individual measure. But on average, Japanese men live now about 80 years. Well, it, it's not correct. So those who are born, baby born, uh, uh, boy uh, baby born this year can expect to live about 80 years on average. For uh, girl babies, they expect about 86.8 years to live. So that life expectancy is computed by uh, mortality. Then, <coughs> So the uh, Japanese life expectancy increasing over time from like 60, uh, 63 to now 80, more than 85 and 80 for men and women. Same thing for at age 65. We can compute life expectancy at different age, at birth and at age 65. So the uh, both we are increasing quite um, rapidly. And in, 1990, uh, in 1997, the, the World Health Report, the uh, then uh, Secretary General, uh, 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 Dr. Nakajima, said that here it says, increased longevity with the quality of life is an empty prize. Health expectancy is more important than life expectancy. So the uh, life expectancy is the length of life the po uh, population can expect to live. 
and health expectancy is the healthy part of that long-lived life. So that's what uh, I'm, I'm interested in, and that's what I'm computing using this survey. The, uh, I'm a part of this REVS group. We are doing this uh, computing health expectancy for many, many years. Over the last 25 years, we are studying health expectancy. And now Japanese government, the uh, Minister of uh, Health, Labor, and Welfare, their health promotion, the, the first uh, target, first priority to extend health expectancy. Same thing in the, in the US. US, they have the healthy people 20, 000, 2000, 2010, 2020. They do uh, um, aim for longer health expectancy. EU country, they have a similar target, extending two, two more years of the health expectancy. So all the uh, uh, countries in the developed countries they're more focusing on the healthy part, not just the length of life. It's the quality of life measured by the health expectancy. And that's what I've been studying and I, I, I'm trying to compute using my data set. And this is an example, the, the, the definition of health expectancy. So life expectancy can be divided into healthy part and unhealthy part. But health expectancy, the, the definition of health is very important. How you define health, you can get many numbers. Okay? So that's something you should remember if, if you have a chance to see this work. And this unhealthy year, the four years of, for example, this, this, I'm using this example, four years of unhealthy years. Four years of unhealthy years do not mean the last four consecutive years of life. Anyway, so. This is health expectancy. That, this is what I'm doing. I'm using, so now I'm, I'm, I'm telling you how I define the health status of my study. And, and I'm using activity of daily living. It's called activity of daily living, which includes whether you can bathe, you can eat by yourself, you can dress by yourself, walking inside the house, and transfer from bed to the chair, and, and toileting by yourself. Those six measures, um, I, we um, define active or inactive. So it's not, it's a definition of health, but it's, it's like an inactive and active. Nowadays I see, it, uh, well these are the definitions I use to define health status, okay? Active and inactive. And the method used is the uh, multi-state life table method. It's uh, existed in demography, but, but the uh, uh, kind of re-implemented by the uh, lodgers and lodgers. And it's called multi-state life table method. And we compute transition probability uh, from healthy, here it's, you, you, there was a word here, the healthy, and here unhealthy, and dead. So you, with the longitudinal study, we can compute uh, the uh, transition probabilities. Those who are healthy at age 65, how many of them move to the unhealthy state at age 67? So we compute those transition probability by age group, by age, then we could see uh, transition probability, including mortality rate. So we had uh, about 1,400 deaths over 15, uh, 10 years. I'm using only wave from wave one to wave five, so it's about 10 years. And over 10 years, we had 1,400 deaths. And we know how many, how they die at, at age, what age. And so from what health status we can compute. So based on this model, we compute health expectancy. And this is the uh, result. Well, this is a study done by Professor Chan here. Uh, she's, she's the next presenter. And myself and the other professor from UCSF. And based on our survey, that the five waves of data, we computed the health expectancy and showed that um, 
I have to explain, but uh, this is mean, uh, medium, medium. So what we include is the age, sex, uh, education, income, and uh, uh, life-threatening disease, and debilitating diseases. So, and uh, um, work status when they're young, the longest work they have done. So those who are in a, a, a high income, high education, no life-threatening disease, no debilitating diseases, and white color, those are the top. So the, uh, uh, if I use the mean values for all the variables I explained, this is what you expect for men, years without uh, inactive, the 17.8 uh, uh, years, disability 1.7 years, total life 18.5 years. But those who are in the high, high uh, uh, categories, like a high education, high income, then you expect 24 years in healthy years and total life 26 years. Those who are in a low level, the uh, low education, low income, with uh, life-threatening disease, debilitating disease, and blue-collar worker, it's 11.5 years. And total life, 13.3. So huge difference between the uh, total life and years without disability. For this is for men, this is for women. So the, uh, those conditions really affect your health status. And um, so this, I'm showing only ages at 65, but that, this will change. And, um, but these are the things I'm studying using longitudinal study. And um, here, um, as I said, I, I released wave one and wave two quite some time ago. And uh, those are available. Here it's in Japanese, and here it's in, from USC, University of Southern California from homepage. There is a, a, a page to explain uh, what the, uh, uh, this uh, survey you can see uh, in English. So data release is difficult for us because we do conduct surveys in Japanese, questionnaire, everything in Japanese. If we want to share, if we want to compare with other countries, we have to make translations for everything, Japanese to English. That costs and takes time and effort. And that's why we had to have this uh, support from NIA uh, to prepare for the releasing of the data set. And fortunately, we had a funding from NIA to, to prepare. So that's why we released the first two waves. And we are planning to do the same for three, four, five in probably probably two years, two, three years, if we successfully get the funding, and then we'll, we'll release the, the, the data. As soon as we, we get the funding, that's the main issue. <laughs> anyway, well, thank you very much for listening, and uh, 